Heavenly Father, thank you for these words. Thank you that we can sing together this request. And we would pray together with the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 1 that the eyes of our hearts would be enlightened, that we might know the hope of your calling, the riches of your glory, of your inheritance in the saints, and the surpassing greatness of your power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of your might, which you brought about in Christ when you raised him from the dead and seated him at his seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. You will put all things in subjection under his feet, and you have given him as head over all things, even over the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God, we are indebted to you because of your great kindness and your love with which you loved us. We ask now by the power of your Holy Spirit and through the clarity of your word that you would instruct us, that we would be encouraged, that we would live as you would have us to live in your body, the church. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. They say that male pattern baldness is a genetic trait passed down from the mother's father. My granddaddy on my mom's side was a cue ball, and I believe I owe my own enviable hairstyle to the engineering principles of genetics. My daughter Zoe pointed this out the other night. She mentioned that with four daughters who may then have sons, that I am doing my part to fill the earth with this unique genetic trait. (laughs) Your genetic programming determines many of your physical characteristics. Why are your eyes brown or blue? Or how tall will you be? Or what infirmities might you be susceptible to later in life? Your genes, which are invisible to you, are the programming data that produce the visible traits that you can see. This morning's message is the fourth in a series called Philosophy of Ministry. Philosophy of Ministry. And a philosophy of ministry for a church is like the genetic coding for a human. I have and will pass on the genes for brown eyes and male pattern baldness. The invisible genetic code expresses itself in visible characteristics. A church's philosophy of ministry while often not explained, expresses itself in the church's programming, presentation, what you see when you show up on a Sunday morning or any of the church's functions. A philosophy of ministry, whether it is explained or whether it remains under the surface, is what really drives a church. In this series so far, we've covered several facets of the philosophy of ministry of Grace Bible Church. Preach the word, shepherd the flock, equip the saints, and this morning, grow the church. The message of the church might be considered its doctrine or its doctrinal statement. And most churches have their doctrinal statements up on their website. And you can read a doctrinal statement of one church and the doctrinal statement of another church and assume these churches are going to be very similar because of their doctrinal statement. But in reality, the method of ministry or the philosophy of ministry may vary greatly between churches. If the doctrine of the church is what the church says it believes, the philosophy of of ministry of the church is how it conveys what it says it believes. The philosophy of ministry is the vehicle for the message. And whether you realize it or not, the Bible actually prescribes both the message and the method both the church's doctrine and how the church is supposed to operate in communicating that doctrine. And there are many churches today who attempt to marry biblical doctrine with man's methodologies under the banner of making the message relevant, of contextualizing the message for a contemporary culture, or any number of other reasons. 
But it's critical that the message of the church, its doctrine, and the philosophy of ministry of the church, its methodology, that they both be biblical. And to state it in terms of George Zemeck's excellent book on this subject, we must be doing God's business God's way. To attempt to convey God's message via man's methods actually compromises the message. I was listening to Billy Joel sing, She's Always a Woman, the other day. It's a beautiful song about an ugly woman. Beautiful accompaniment and compelling, heart-rending melodies. Billy Joel describes a thieving, conniving, and lying woman. It's completely incongruous. He should have sung an uglier song or described a more virtuous woman. It's like singing happy birthday slowly in a minor key. The the message and the vehicle of the message are incongruous. Um, It's like a tuba lullaby. (laughs) Or maybe like performing Beethoven's Wellington's Victory on a kazoo. If you've heard Wellington's Victory, you know that to be performed properly, it requires a large orchestra with an overwhelming brass and percussion section, and actually, to do it right, it requires live muskets and 109 live cannon. To play such a song on a a kazoo actually compromises the message. If a philosophy of ministry is incongruent with the doctrinal statement of a church, Just give it time, and eventually the doctrine of the church will change as well. The message and the method of conveying it must fit and work together. If you say that you believe, for instance, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, Romans 1.16, but in practice, you try every gimmick under the sun to try to get people to feel positively about Jesus then your philosophy of ministry does not match the message you say you believe, and eventually the message itself is undermined by your method. So this morning we're continuing our intermittent series on a philosophy of ministry. And the aspect of that philosophy of ministry this morning comes from Ephesians 4.16, and the idea there is grow the church, grow the church. The elders at Grace Bible Church desire for the church to grow, and and this desire is in keeping with the desires of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He is the head of the church, he has purchased the church, he has established the church, and he said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In fact, we know that the church is the vehicle by which Jesus accomplishes his mission to take his message to the ends of the earth. Every tongue and tribe and nation and people will surround the throne of the Lamb in worship because they have believed the gospel. And the church, local churches, in expansion from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria, Samaria, to Tempe, to Papua New Guinea. The church is the vehicle by which Jesus is accomplishing his message. So I hope that you're interested in church growth This is near and dear to Jesus' own heart and is part of the warp and woof of what makes Grace Bible Church what it is. But it's important for us to understand what it is we mean by church growth. There are a number of church growth strategies out there, and a lot of them are based around the question, how do we get more people in the door? Mass mailings, billboards, relevant preaching, shorter sermons, no sermons, celebrity speakers, music performed to sound like the latest stadium band, a laser light show and smoke machines, giving away Disneyland tickets, or build Disneyland in the basement of your church so that the kids will love to come. And any number of other kinds of strategies enlisted to try to get more people into the building. What do these things require? These strategies require gurus, money, strategizing, planning, leadership, bureaucracies, musicians, props, technology, sermon writers, teams of sermon writers. You'll notice very quickly I do not have such a team. (laughs) Theatrics, planners, hype, advertising, slogans, marketers, surveys, mailings, etc., 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 And the question we need to ask is, 
Are these the kinds of things that Jesus requires to accomplish his mission? In fact, can these strategies grow a church under persecution, say in the Muslim world, or under poverty, an economic downturn, or in Papua New Guinea, in a tribal setting? We need to back up and define what we mean by growth, and we need to allow the New Testament to be the blueprint for how we do church growth. There's no need to reinvent church growth strategies here, but simply follow God's script. Churches today tend to think of growth in terms of numbers, buildings, empires, activities, programs, busyness, but the kind of growth that Jesus is interested in, the kind of growth he designs is actually laid out for us in Scripture And I want to turn our hearts and our attentions to Ephesians chapter 4 this morning to see that. And we're going to read together beginning in verse 1 through verse 16. And then we're going to focus our time this morning on verse 16. Paul writes, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? And he who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. This is God's blueprint for church growth. What kind of growth does God have in mind? In verses 11 to 15, we see leaders equipping believers for ministry until there is unity in the faith, knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man. That is a maturity in keeping with the fullness of Christ. Uh, Not being like children that is gullible and vulnerable to every trend that blows through town, but to be speaking truth in love and growing up in all aspects into Jesus, the head of the church. That kind of growth cannot be measured by numbers of people in attendance, by rows of cars in the parking lot, by the size of a budget or a building, by programs or activities or online followers, or by how many of its bumper stickers show up in the morning commute. Jesus is very interested in church growth. And Jesus has a plan to grow his church, and it is laid out for us very plainly in his word. We don't have to go looking elsewhere for this plan. The blueprint is here in Ephesians 4. And this morning, what I want us to contemplate is, how does the church grow? How does this church growth actually happen? I mean, mechanically, how does the growth actually occur? And we find this out in Ephesians 4.16. And I think we find a very shocking answer to this question. If you were to ask, whose job is it to grow the church? You might say, Jesus, and you'd be right. Whose job is it to grow the church? You might say, church leaders, and according to Ephesians 4, again, you would be right. But in Ephesians 4.16, we find that church growth requires not gadgets and gurus, not marketing firms and management teams, not billboards and bumper stickers, 
but you. You. Look at Ephesians 4.16. From whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now this, at first glance, seems like a great big jumble of words. You grammarians out there are already diagramming this sentence in your head. (laughs) If you were diagramming this sentence in your head, you would discover that there is a subject, there is a verb, and there is an object. And the subject of the sentence is the body, the whole body. And the verb in this section is causes the growth, causes the growth. And... What is the object? What is it that is grown? The body. The body causes the growth of the body. If we boil that whole sentence down to this, it is simply this. The church produces the growth of the church. And what we want to look at this morning is how this happens. Ephesians 4.16 is going to lead us to something very basic in our service. Sometimes we think of service in the church, our part in the church is, what official title do I have? What ministry am I in? Uh, Where am I serving officially? But Ephesians 4.16 is about something much more basic than some official ministry position. There's an element of our service that is organic, non-official. It is personal and it is relational. And we'll find that that is really where the energizing supply of power for church growth happens. So here's God's blueprint for the growth of his church. It's the church. And there are four essential elements of church growth we'll look at from Ephesians 4.16. And we'll talk briefly for the first three and we'll spend more time on the fourth. The first essential element of church growth from Ephesians 4.16 is the source of church growth. The source of church growth. And the source is Jesus. He is the ultimate agent in the growth of his church. We see that in verse 15. Uh, even Christ, and then verse 16 starts with the little phrase, from whom. The whom there is Christ. The body crosses the growth of the body from Christ. Jesus Christ is the source. And in Ephesians 4, Jesus is not merely the source of the growth of the church. He's also the equipper of the church, verse 11. He gave some as apostles, prophets, evangelists. By the way, numbers do matter. Jesus gave to the church evangelists to share the gospel so that others would come to faith in Christ. But he also gave pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints. Jesus has outfitted the church with leaders who, in turn, equip all of us to do the work of the ministry. And I would remind you of Scott's message in the Philosophy of Ministry series entitled, Equip the Saints comes from Ephesians 4.12. Scott's job, the pastors of this church, their job is not to do the ministry, but equip all of us to do the ministry. Jesus is not only the equipper of the church, he is also the focal point of the church, verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the knowledge of the Son of God. Knowing God through Jesus Christ is the central task of the church. Jesus is also the standard of the church in verse 13, to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Jesus is the standard. He is also the goal of the church, verse 15. We are to grow up in all aspects into him. We are aiming at him. And Jesus is the authority over the church, verse 15. Jesus is the head. That is, he provides direction and provision and protection for the church. But in verse 16... Paul makes it clear that Jesus is the source of the growth of the church. Whatever our part, whatever our service, whatever our labors, Jesus Christ said he would build his church, Matthew 16, 18. He is the ultimate source of growth for his body, the church. The second essential element for us to understand is the purpose of church growth. Why has Jesus produced the church? By the way, we know that anybody who's in the true church is there only by the blood of Jesus Christ. He is the purchaser of the church by his own blood. You get in only through the blood of Jesus Christ where forgiveness of sin is purchased for all who would believe. But to what purpose has Jesus instituted this thing called the church? It tells us in verse 16, for the building up of the whole church. 
Listen to these phrases in verse 16. The whole body. And the body causes, and the word causes there is uh, technically a a middle voice verb of self-interest. In other words, the, the subject is the focus of the action. The church is, whatever it's doing in this verse, is doing for itself. And what is the church doing? It causing the growth of the body, growth of the whole body. And at the end of the verse, for the building up of itself. The whole body collectively, comprised of all its constituent parts together, brings about for itself its own growth for the purpose of building up the whole. The local church here is seen as an organism whose various parts are operating in unison to bring about the development of the whole. Can you imagine a physical body whose individual parts were intent on self-aggrandizement over and against the development of the whole body? An elbow, perhaps, that decided, you know, I'm going to be the big deal around here. What do you call it when one part of a human body grows out of proportion with the rest? That's a disease, a, a cancer. And these kinds of things are crippling to the rest of the body. And what about when one part of the body fails to grow? Again, crippling disease and malformation. You see, your part in the body of Christ is not individualistic. You have not been rescued by God for the purpose of serving yourself. You have not been placed by God into the body, equipped by church leaders, gifted by the Holy Spirit, in order to serve you. Your service in the church is not primarily about you. And when we think it is, it reveals that we're terrible at astronomy, right? We've constructed a universe for ourselves where we are the center Everything revolves around me. But the purpose of church growth and the purpose of your part in serving the church is the growth of the whole body. And any strategy for church growth that is content to draw inordinate attention to one member or is content to leave any individual members stagnant or struggling or helpless does not meet God's purpose for the growth of the church. So we've seen the source of church growth, the purpose of church growth. Thirdly, we see the climate of church growth, the climate of church growth. We might call this the atmosphere of church growth, and it is love, love. Notice what Paul says, for the building up of itself in love. In love has to do with the climate or the atmosphere in which the church will thrive and grow as God intends. Love here is not about the gushy feelings we get when we're around the people that we like. This is love from God, producing love through us for others, and it is selfless and sacrificial. Don't miss this little prepositional phrase, in love. If love has left the building, you can be assured that whatever is happening in the organization is not true church growth. If love is to be the atmosphere for the growth of the church, then the quality of the growth of any church may be tested by the reality of its love. Love for God, expressed between its members, love for those outside. One commentator said this, love thus becomes the criterion for an assessment of the church's true growth. So there is the source and the purpose and the climate of church growth. And now the fourth essential element of church growth from this verse, we're going to spend most of our time here this morning, the cause, the cause of church growth. And again, the cause of church growth is you. It's the church. The body causes the growth of the body. And a growing body is described in this way, being fitted and held together by every joint of the supply according to the proper working of each individual part. Notice, first of all, that the church here is called a body. It's a common metaphor. Paul uses it in Romans and 1 Corinthians, Colossians, and Ephesians. It is an organization of interdependent parts, interconnected with one another. And the church here is described as an entire body or a whole body. That is, it's a collective organism. And within that organism, there is unity and diversity. Various parts, but one body. And and we are diverse ethnically, socially. We're diverse in gifting, in personalities, in ages, in experience. And the church is described as an entire body built by God. 
And Paul uses two illustrations to get across this idea. The first one comes from the world of architecture. He describes the church being fitted together. And the word used here for being fitted together comes from the world of of ancient architecture, to be tightly joined together. It was used to describe the stonework in ancient construction. No mortar between stones, but perfectly precision-cut rocks stuck together so they fit tightly and made a solid structure. It took precision and care and design. And then Paul uses another illustration, this one not from the world of architecture, but from medicine, a physiological illustration, being held together. And this is a word that was used to describe organic tissue, a medical term describing a body being held together in its parts, compacted, knit together, interwoven, and solid. Both of these descriptions, being fitted together and being held together, are present tense, ongoing, and they're both passive That means God is the one doing this. God is the one fitting us together, holding us together. God is the one uh, doing this work of compacting and knitting us together in a body and in a building. God is the master builder. By the way, any view of a solo Christian, a rogue Christian, a cowboy Christian, lone wolf, out on your own, riding the trail is foreign to the New Testament concept of being a follower of Jesus. God, by his Holy Spirit, places believers into the body. And a Christian who is not vitally connected to a local church is disobedient to Jesus' commands, dismembered from Jesus' purpose, and distant from Jesus' power. And in the church, you and I are not just next to each other. Believers are to be interwoven knit together, tightly compacted, interdependent, and we, like a physical body, are organically connected. A pastor, Charles Simeon, said it this way, believers are no more independent of each other than they are of Christ. As they are united unto him by faith, so they are united to each other in love. Notice the second part of verse 16. By what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building of itself in love. The body, fitted and joined together, causes the growth of the body. The idea of causing the growth is makes the growth or does the growth or accomplishes the growth. And we can examine this growth by asking several questions By what means does the body grow the body? And to what degree does the body grow the body? We might ask it this way. How does the body grow the body? And how well is the body growing the body? First, let's ask, by what means does the body grow the body? How does this work? And Paul answers this by saying, by every joint of supply. And we're talking about a body, we're talking about joints. Don't think about joints the way we think about them today, you know, an elbow joint, a knee joint. What Paul means here and what this word meant in the ancient Near East as a medical term just meant points of contact between physiological features. You can think ligaments and sinews and and tissue. And in this metaphor of the church, this is where believers rub up against one another. These are our connection points. And what Paul says about that is those connection points are points of supply, of life, vitality, energy for growth of the entire body. This word supply indicates abundant provision. The joints of supply are the means by which the parts of the body are fitted and held together, and God holds us together by means of the life which flows from him through us to each other. And this unified, interconnected body causes the growth of the whole body. These are the places where you and I come into contact in the body of Christ. This is where vitality and life and energy for growth are found. Jesus fuels the growth of his body through our connectedness, through our interdependence. And in the original, there's a definite article in this phrase, every joint of supply. It's every joint of the supply. And this indicates that there is only one source of supply ultimately, and it's Jesus himself. He is the life that causes the church to grow. 
The question for us is this, how well are you connected to the body, to other members of the body? Do you feel a loss when someone is missing? Do others feel a loss when you're missing? How well are you connected to the other members of this body throughout the week? Is church something I just do and come here on a Sunday and check off a box and leave? Or am I organically, interdependently connected with others? You see, no part of the body is unneeded or superfluous. Every member of the body has been placed by God into this body for the growth of the body. So how does the body cause the growth of the body? By our being with each other, channeling Jesus' spiritual life in our points of connection. The second question is, how well are we causing the growth of the body? How well are we causing the growth of the body? Paul says it this way, according to the proper working of each individual part. Literally, the measured working. And, and back up in Ephesians 4, 7, Paul told us that to each one of us was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. You see, each one of us has been given by Christ things that contribute to the growth of the whole. Are we operating according to that standard? Are we measuring up, to use Paul's words? You see, the body does not work well. Individual parts are not working well. A number of years ago, I uh, cut myself shaving. There was blood everywhere. Couldn't get it to stop. And I thought, how do we get bleeding to stop? Call Jake Hantla. <laughs> if you call Jake Hantla about how to get bleeding to stop, he, he might not give you the remedy. He might just be overwhelmed by the, the physiological mechanics behind what is known as the coagulation cascade. Right? He's going to tell you about the vascular spasm that begins right at the point of injury, that, that it begins instantaneously and lasts 20 to 30 minutes. And, and after that begins what's called a platelet plug, where platelets flowing in the bloodstream come in contact with damaged vascular surface, and they begin to swell. And they grow these weird protrusions, and they get sticky, and they begin to stick to one another and stick to the damaged surface. After that begins blood coagulation, that is a clot, and it forms in three to six minutes. And between 30 minutes and an hour later, the clot begins to retract and, and pulls the broken surfaces together. And then eventually the clot itself dissolves or turns into fibrous tissue. It's a complicated process, step by step by step, and every part of that process involves complex chemical processes, chemical activators, and clotting factors. And if any one of those chemical activators is missing or malfunctioning, then the whole chain of events is interrupted, and either you bleed out and die, or you clot at the wrong times and die. All of these individual little pieces critical parts of the body's function. And if they're not functioning properly, the body can't survive. And we should take a time out here for a mini-sermon on the beauty and complexity of God's creation and irreducibly complex systems that could not have evolved, but we won't do that. <laughs> Let's think about this. Am I operating properly in the body of Christ, in my interconnected, interdependent relationships. Let's imagine that uh, one of the individuals in this church, uh, let's say Scott Demarest, is reading his Bible, and he's spending time with God in prayer, and he's being transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, boasting in the gospel, loving and telling others about Jesus and all that he's done for him. What happens when Scott bumps into another believer, all of that life and vitality and Christness spills out of him onto someone else. Spiritual energy, energy, vitality, and life from God overflowing into the life of another member of the body. The point of connection is the channel of supply for growth, but not just for Scott, but for others, whoever he's connected to. And when you get excited about what you read in God's Word and you tell someone else about it, who benefits? Who gets encouraged? Who grows? Both of you do. You see, the sum is greater than its parts. 
When all the members of the body are working together according to the proper measure of Christ's gift in each individual, the entire body grows. And the growth is greater than the individuals involved. It's exponential and contagious growth. What kind of conversations are you having with other believers? I think this is exactly the kind of application Paul has in mind in verse 14, just above. Speaking the truth in love to each other, we are to grow. And we're to be discerning, not as children tossed by every wind of doctrine, we are to grow. So encouraging one another with the truth in love is a primary application of this idea. And this is ministry. The members of the body join together and working for mutual growth. The pastors of this church, their task is not to do the ministry, but equip you to do the work of the ministry. And the ministry is not necessarily about a title in the church or a position or a task or some delegated responsibility. It's about each individual channeling life, spiritual life, from Jesus to each other, being conduits of God's truth and love and life and vitality to one another, the fuel for the growth of the church. Now let's turn that around and think negatively for just a moment. Uh, we won't name anybody, but let's just say an unnamed member of Grace Bible Church stagnates in his growth in Christ. He's not exercising shepherding care over his own heart. He's not reading his Bible, or maybe he's reading just to check off a box, not truly meeting with God, even with his Bible open. His prayer life is languishing. His heart is not being refreshed in its dependence upon God. He's living life in his own strength. His life is consumed by temporal concerns, school, work, relationships, entertainment. He's forgotten that life is short, that hell is real, and that heaven is home. His affections for Jesus are cold. He seldom reflects on the death of Christ in his place. He forgets the rescue that was purchased for him by God at the cross, and he lets sin go unchecked. Now, when he rubs up against other believers, what is the result? What effect does this have? You see, your life is not just about you. Believer, you have been placed by God into a body, and Jesus is very concerned that this body grow to maturity, and the means by which that body grows is the body itself, fitted together by every joint of supply, according to the proper working of each individual part. So when you sit down to read your Bible in the morning, it's not just about you. The state of your own heart has profound effect on the others connected to you. So is the growth of the church an individual or a group effort? Yes. <laughs> and this is the beauty and the danger of organic interdependence. The beauty is we grow together. The danger is we falter together. How well are you working? Is your individual Christian life tightly connected to the lives of others? And is it working properly? The church is designed to grow. The reason that there is a body composed of many diverse members connected to each other, dependent on one another, supplying life to each other through their connectedness is so that the whole organism will grow, and this is the design of God. If we never sin against each other, I'm convinced it's because we're not around each other enough, not connected enough, not dependent enough upon each other. If we're connected as we should be, we will sin against each other. <laughs> We'll rub each other the wrong way. We will offend with our words, offend with our actions, offend with our silence and our misunderstandings. Sinning each, against each other, and I'm not in, endorsing and encouraging this behavior, but the inevitable reality is if we're connected correctly, we will. And this provides a, a remarkable opportunity to express love through confession and repentance and restoration. I mean, what, what is the opposite of that? Oh, I just got sinned against. I'm going to another church, or I'm never going to church again. What a tragedy. Contrary to God's very design. Why is the goal of church growth the building up of itself in love? Because the church, as the body of Christ, is to exemplify the goals and aims and directions and character of its head. My hands are supposed to do what my brain tells them to do. In preaching to junior hires years ago, 
uh, I, I noticed out at the, the crowd that there were some junior hires making funny gestures with their hands. They were going like this. What are these guys doing? Clowns. Why don't they pay attention? Well, they were mimicking me. I didn't realize that, you know, talking, using my hands, and here's a comfortable way to hold your hands, and maybe this, and then if you want to emphasize something from this gesture, you have to go like this. <laughs> Nobody taught me that. It just happened, and, and they were making fun of me. When parts of our body act contrary to the desires of the head or contrary to the well-being of the other parts of the body, we call that disease. My hands are supposed to do what my brain tells them to do. And when they don't, that, that's a problem. Now let's think about our involvement at Grace Bible Church. If you're serving in an official capacity of ministry, that's great. There's so many needs. I'd love to sell you on the needs in next generation ministries, especially. I was just with a, a, a bunch of other pastors from all over the place, and I'm, I'm always asking pastors, what do you do about children's ministry if you have this many adults and this many children? And they all say, we don't have that many children. <laughs> There's no one to compare us to, so I'm making my plug. There's a need. But in whatever service you're serving, whatever official capacity or title, make sure that your service is actually serving. Not just fulfilling a task, but, but doing this vitality, energy, spiritual life kind of serving through interconnectedness. If your job is to play the triangle for the praise team for the third grade NGM class, I don't know if we have one of those, and if you're the triangle player, I'm sorry. <laughs> if that's your job, then make sure that your service isn't all about your talents on the triangle, right? You have to make sure that your service it flows out of your growth in love for God and your knowledge of Him through His Word. And then let that spill out onto the lives of others around you. Maybe this morning you're feeling like you really want to find a place to serve in the church, and maybe you go up to one of the, the pastors or ministry leaders and you say, where can I serve? And, and maybe you get one of these responses, hmm, I'm not sure. Let me get back to you. You know, the, the NGM is completely staffed. Um, someone's already preaching the book of Romans. Um, we have a lot of drummers. Uh, the bathrooms, they're all spotless. Uh, the shut-ins are visited so much, they're asking for some me time. Um, you know, every radius, every residence within a radius of seven miles of this church is already evangelized every week. All the weeds are pulled in the, in the yard out front and the, the windows are washed. I, I don't know if there's anything official that I can give. If you get that response, please don't feel like you have no place of service. <laughs> The aim of the pastors of this church, the, the philosophy of ministry as we think about church growth is to equip you for the work of ministry and it doesn't require a title or a position or a task list or a name badge. It requires you growing in your love for God and your knowledge of his word, being connected to others in real relationship. That is the real mechanism for church growth more than any program, more than any position. And that point of contact between growing believers is the immediate cause of the growth of Jesus' church by his design. For the elders of Grace Bible Church, when we think about church growth, uh, we don't think in terms of how can we get more people in the door, but how can we help the people who are here grow Grow in their maturity, grow in their discernment, grow in their love for one another and service to one another. And do we want to see more people come to know Christ? Absolutely. But we think in terms of ministries like build. The fundamental discipleship for men where we're growing in the way that we discipline our own hearts. We think of ministries like Wellspring where we're essentially doing the same disciplines for the women in the church and, and, and small groups where we interact and, and live out the one another commands with each other in small interwoven groups, next generation ministries and, and Bible studies and, and eventually seminary training. 
These are ways we think about the growth of the church, growth in its maturity, growth in its knowledge of God and love for God, and growth in its witness to a world that desperately needs the message of the gospel. These are things God loves. These are things we must aim at. Let's pray. God, thank you for this morning and for this reminder of what the church is and should be. God, we just recognize that we are not a perfect one. There hasn't been a perfect one yet, and yet you are eager to accomplish your perfect mission through imperfect means like us. May we be faithful to be useful in your hands, to be used by you to accomplish what you are doing, to take the great name of your son, to take his finished work at the cross to every people and tribe and tongue and nation, to Tempe and this valley, to Papua New Guinea and everywhere in between. And we pray that we might just be a faithful part of what you're doing in that. In Jesus' name, amen.